This is History 9, and we come to the third stage of our history. And just as in every other season, every other phase, every other quarter of our education, we're, we are moving in a very characteristic way. We're building a structure, and it's a structure of our attention. And in order to gain structure, we have to set up a kind of paired quality and watch that the pairs do not become overly polarized, which would end up in creating um, an impasse. If something becomes overpolarized, it tends to either short itself out or it tends to become a closed loop or it tends to polarize everything else. So in our structure of using pairs of texts, we're constantly struggling to keep them from being polarities and keeping them what we talked about in the first year of parallels. And the idea goes back to the first century AD, back to the idea of Plutarch. Plutarch, who was a teacher in Greece, even though it was in Roman Empire times, he was a teacher in the mystery religions. And his works were revered so much that some 26 volumes of them have survived from antiquity. And the most parallel, live uh, idea that Plutarch had, uh, this idea of parallel lives, became the number one idea, which when it was revived in the Renaissance, which we'll talk about today a little bit, it became one of the founding ideas of the modern era. The idea is this, in order to understand a human being, a human personality, in all of its scintillation, you need a background which is complex enough to allow for the complete complexity to be seen and appreciated. The only context and background complex enough to allow the form of a spiritual person in all of its array to be appreciated is another person. So the idea of parallel lives where you see the one against the other and constantly shifting back and forth. So that complexity of form requires a complexity of background. And the human personality, in its conscious differential gestalt, is capable of being seen only against two backgrounds. One is another person, and the other is an instance which belongs to the future and that is to be seen against the background of the cosmos as a whole. So one of the most profound ideas from antiquity, from the Renaissance, and from our time at the beginning of the 21st century is the profound idea that when the spiritual maturity of a person is completely unfolded, they are not some static form but they are an infinity in process of opening. They are a jewel whose glints have no limits. And so the prism of the person, of a spiritually conscious human being, the person, the personality, becomes a universal complexity. And only seen in tandem with another person or seen against the cosmos as a whole is the only way to appreciate uh, the completeness and the perfection of the spiritual person. So when we're talking about a human being in this education, we're talking about the maturation through many phases. But three phases have stood out for us. The first was the achievement of the existential body of our practical life, which is registered there in ritual and in the very first year 
ritual was our first level of objectivity. The second level of objectivity is the mind, the symbolic objectivity. The body and the mind both register. And the third objectivity is the person. Our person is a real form, has objectivity, has effect in the universe. Persons count, minds count, bodies count. All three deserve a respect on an equal level so that body, mind, and spirit, you've heard that phrase before, they belong to a trinity, they belong to a triumvirate, to a triangle, to a three quality. So someone that teaches body, mind, and spirit in antiquity, that teacher who would teach all three together would be called a thrice greatest teacher, someone who teaches all of those three together and brings them into maturity together. But we've seen that the person's objectivity is of a different mode from the body and the mind. The body and the mind are both integral, whereas the person is differential. And the only other objective reality in the universe, which is differential, is the cosmos itself. So literally when we're talking about the differential, we're talking about a quality where the person and the cosmos, person and cosmos, are both objective. They're objective in a way in which the body and the mind are objective. And they go together like a pair. Body and mind are paired in the natural cycle of integration, and person and cosmos are paired in the differential cycle of consciousness. Now from this, just so far, one can draw enormous implications. One implication is that the cosmos is alive and conscious. Heaven is conscious. It's not a neutral wallpaper in the sky, but that the cosmos is a unity, but not an integral unity, a differential unity. Like the person is a unity, but is not an integral unity, is a differential unity. One of the most profound mystical conscious statements ever made was in his book on democratic vistas by Walt Whitman, written after five years of thinking of the death and assassination of Abraham Lincoln, Whitman tried to formulate the kind of statement that the mature Lincoln in his old age would have made. And so Whitman wrote this book, Democratic Vistas, as sort of the alter ego of the spiritual Abraham Lincoln. And Whitman in Democratic Vistas said, nature seems to like, whether we like it or not, nature likes two things above all else for our kind. She likes variety and she likes freedom. That's what she likes. And these are both qualities of a differential sense of unity. So that variety where the spectrum increases its capacity is characteristic of spiritual persons. A more humorous uh, version of it, there was a science fiction writer named Spider Robinson who wrote a whole series of books about a bar called Callahan's, which exists where time and space come together. And so there are creatures from all different times and all different universes that come to drink together and swap stories. Callahan's cross time bar. And one of the things that comes out of this kind of thing is the appreciation for the weird, wonderful variety that life forms take in different cosmoses and different times and that this is all interesting. So that the God of reality likes variety and likes freedom and that those as a pair go together. 
and they are characteristics of a differential objectivity. One of the problems in our time was the misappreciation of this kind of differential mode to reality because the transposition of shapes of differential reality, when they are transposed into the integral mode unconsciously or subconsciously or reductively, produce a lot of problems. One then gets the reverse. One gets the polarized opposite. And instead of variety, one gets conformity as an ideal for persons. Instead of freedom, one gets control, authority, authoritarianism. And when raised to a political structure, it becomes totalitarianism. These kinds of reductive opposites have been characteristic of the 20th century. And our uh, generation and the couple of generations before then have since 1914 gone through what one could call the meat grinder. Uh, when he got the Nobel Prize for Literature in 1954, William Faulkner said, what's wrong with our time is fear. We can't get away from fear, but we have lived for several generations now in a universal fear, so much a part of life that we've gotten used to it. We no longer understand the old truths of the heart, the old bones of courage and sacrifice upon which human life really thrives. And that was uh, some uh, 43 years ago, and it's continued unabated ever since. So that for the last uh, 80 to 85 years, human beings on this planet have lived in a fear bath, have lived in a shower of terror, so long that living human memory cannot remember a time when it wasn't. And that leads us into one of today's pairs, Jacob Burkhardt, and immediately throws us into the other pair with Burkhardt, um, the philosopher G.W.F. Hegel. Now let's circle back and let's come back to the beginning because our technique here is one of reconnoitering, not of circularity, but of reconnoitering in this kind of infinity sign way. Because it does not matter where you are if you use this ancient hunting technique, this Paleolithic hunter's technique, you can always find where you are. Paleolithic hunters had no maps. They didn't know the names of anything. There were no names. But the old Paleolithic hunting technique, which has been passed on for hundreds of thousands of years to hunters, works. Wherever you are, you make a little sachet one way and circle back, and then you make another sachet of equal amount the other way and come back. And you keep making these sachets and keep coming back in a balanced way, and eventually, not only will you map the territory, but you will locate everything in relationship to your starting point. And in that sense, you build an intimate acquaintance with everything. An English noble friend of mine said uh, that uh, he grew up on an estate that was 25 square miles in the 20th century. But like in the ancient technique, he grew up having to ride it on horseback every day. And he said, when you grow up that way, you know every stone in that 25 square miles. You know the land, and the land has a call to you. You know when the land is OK. You know when something needs tending. I remember being taken to the, when I was 12, I was taken to the, uh, the place where the Weirs had lived for about seven generations in southern Illinois, not far from uh, the Wabash River, 
a little place that has maybe 50 people, uh, West Union, Illinois, named because it was the furth furthest western point in the Revolutionary War that Americans had got to. And my family was the first family in that part of Illinois. And I remember going there and walking on that land and feeling the quiet, affine call of the land. That there's such a thing of the land knowing you, knowing your, who you are. It's a kind of a quality of that rooted feeling. It's like Alex Haley in his beautiful volume, Roots, the sense that one comes to a terrain that recognizes you. And there's this immense quiet that comes out of that. Not a quiet of the ear, but a quiet of the soul, a quiet of the spirit. Because there is a resonance, not of opposites between integral and differential. The integral and the differential are not polarities, but they're complementarities. And so there comes this kind of sense where there's a great equanimity, there's a great balance. And when the person achieves their sense of differential wholeness, they have a complementation and a balance that comes all the way back and reaches all the way back so that the person has the sense of where existence on the level of ritual comportment, the, the body and the person have this equanimity. They recognize each other. And the actual body and the actual person, the spiritual person, recognize that they're not opposites. One is not evil and the other good. One is not real and the other fictitious but that the body becomes saved. It finds its salvation because the spiritual person realizes in complementation that they go together. Like Chuck Berry said once in one of his lyrics, like two straws in a Coke. They go together. It's just that kind of, a, it's more than a synergy. It's a complementarity. It's a principle so deep that it characterizes nuclear physics. It characterizes astrophysical mathematics. It works, but it works on such a profound depth that it works not only in practice, but it works in the depths of theory. And because theory and practice can jibe together, one can turn the profound truth of thoughts into mathematical formula that then influence how reality works. One of the biggest magics of all time was when Robert Oppenheimer took a Einstein mathematical equation, e equals mc squared, and turned it into nuclear power in a short space, about two and a half, three years. It was like a sign of peril and promise at the same time, that human beings had learned at last that symbolic forms in the mind, when handled by spiritually differential mature people, can reach back and can change nature, can change existence. It has, yes, a peril, but it has also a promise. But just as the spiritual person and the existential body fit together in an equilibrium, they happen to be like two straws in a Coke, just so the objectivity of the mind has its complementarity in the objectivity of the cosmos, symbol and cosmos go together. They fit together. So there comes a moment when the mind in its objectivity recognizes that it has a relationality, it has a brother, it has a sister, 
It has a sibling relationality with heaven, with the cosmos, that the heavens are related in a family way to the minds, just like the existential bodies are related to spiritual persons. And in this way, all of the phony polarities that have kept things apart, kept things confused, are resolved. It's not that there are answers to questions, but it's re resolutions of whole fields, of complete fields. So let's come back again. Let's come back to the beginning of the lecture. We're talking about building a structure we're at the beginning of the third pair of texts, uh, Hegel's uh, lectures on the philosophy of world history and Burkhardt's civilization of the Renaissance in Italy. And we're using these two books as our third pair in history. It's the third time so that we're building the first pair, the second pair, and the third pair. And when you have this kind of a structure, which we've repeated consistently through our education, we did these three pairs in nature, we did them in ritual, we did them in myth, we did them in symbols, we did them in vision, we did them in art, and now we're doing them in history, we will do them in science. We're building a relationality and it's a primordial way of building a relationality. It's like the uh, ancient Chinese who discovered that there was a complementation that happens in reality that's very mysterious. The complementation is either something moves or it doesn't. That there's movement or there's stillness. And that movement and stillness as a complementarity, are a trustworthy structure on which to build. And so they symbolized movement by a line. Movement is simply this. Non-movement is this. But instead of making it no movement whatsoever, in order to emphasize that it was a non-movement, they would go like this, and leave a space in between, a broken line. And so the Chinese, some 5,000 years ago, were able to symbolize this movement and non-movement as a line unbroken and as a line broken. And they found that you could build a structure by having all of the characteristics of the lines, broken and unbroken, that you could have them build up and make a structure, but that the structure was not simply a coupling, not simply a pair. As long as you had a pair, you ended up dead even. Because you could start with a broken line or an unbroken line and put the other on top. And that would give you these kinds of options. Or you could have two unbroken lines or two broken lines. And that would give you those options. But the matrix of all those options together ends up at dead even. It ends up at a limbo. Whereas you've, you put a repeat of one of those lines twice, it sets a dynamic in motion. And instead of the matrix being dead even, it becomes generative. It generates forms. The only provision is that you have to put the third line in in a complete way, so you have to put a pair of third lines in. A third set of unbroken and broken lines. And when you do that, then you get as a basic structure the trigrams of the I Ching and the eight possibilities of those pairs of lines in triadic forms. It turns out that the uh, possibilities are um, 
uh, two cubed. That's the mathematical way of saying it. Two times two times two, which is eight. So that the parrotness, when it's cubed, gives you the full form, all of the possibilities of the form. So the cubic relationship of complementarities is a very trustworthy universal principle of form. You can count on it in any star system that you happen to live, in any galaxy. It will hold. The basic problem is to understand that your interpretive qualities must have some way of keeping in harmonic to that universal structure. So for the Chinese, the way that they figured out how to keep the harmony there in the structure was to take that two cubed, that eight, and give it another pair, but a pair in a multiple sense so that you have eight squared. Eight times eight equals 64 which turns out to be the full cycle of where the trigrams are brought together in their pairs and made into hexagrams. And so the Chinese came up not only with eight trigrams, which are the uh, cubic possibilities of the pair of yin and yang, but that the 64 hexagrams are then a balanced complementation structure that shows the harmonic working at a high enough level of complexity that you can apply it to nature. You can apply, apply it to the real world, and it'll hold. It is true that one could have a super sophisticated complementation by taking pairs of hexagrams, but that complexity was out of the possibility of the Chinese 5,000 years ago handling it, whereas they could handle the eight trigrams, and the 64 hexagrams. What I'm saying, and we're coming back now to the beginning of the lecture, we're coming back to the point that we've come back to twice, and now it's the third time. So this is the fourth time that we've come to this particular point. We're using pairs, parallels, twins, not in polarized form, to generate some kind of power. We're using pairs to generate resonance. So this education develops the facility for resonant action rather than power. The slogan in the 21st century is not power to the people, but resonance to the people. So that whatever they do has a characteristic effect of, of Continuing. It's a whole different way of looking at society. It's a whole different history. It's a completely different politic. It's a different sociology, a different psychology, a different individuality. Where someone else, rather than being an other, is a possible pair to you. Every other person is a possibility of a pair to you, which increases the variety of resonant possibility. Now, when you have a world that has that kind of an outlook, meeting anyone is an adventure and possibility. That's a whole different kind of humanity than the warring, bickering, ferret existence that was passed on to us in the 20th century so that we have this possibility, not of a universal peace that's boring, but of a universal harmony that is so interesting that people do not have time to hurt each other. There's so much that's of interest that's going on, and anybody is a potential companion in the most unexplored areas of possibility. It makes Disneyland look like a tomb. So this whole structure, and we'll come back to it again for a fifth time, the whole structure is that we're building pairs of texts, pairs of books by 
three sets in order to make these kinds of trigrams for ourselves. Not the Chinese trigrams of 5,000 years ago. We've learned a lot. We're a planetary population now, a planetary culture. Not just the northern uh, valley of classical China. Not just the, uh, the old uh, uh, Huang Ho, the Yellow River Valley where all this in China happened 5,000 years ago. An area that you could fly over in a Mach 3 jet in about four minutes. That was all the world to the Chinese of, that made the I Ching originally. We live on a planet that the whole planet is available as a culture. But we're waking up to the fact that the planetary culture is an integral form and that it has a complementary form. And the complementarity to the integral is the differential. What's the differential form? If human beings fit into a planetary culture integrally, what is their differential form? And as far as we can see at this point, the differential form is a star system civilization of many planets and many more moons and countless other bodies all together, the whole star system. The whole star system is a patch of land which will grow conscious of us, just as we will grow conscious of it. That the whole star system will recognize us. Not just those few who control by power, but everyone who participates in the differential adventure. That the whole star system will recognize that you're at home, wherever you are. It'll take a couple hundred years to do this, but what's a couple hundred years? It'll be a fantastic adventure. But an education like this is the transformational point. It's the node that changes the old calibration that loved power and authority and didn't understand that it leads always to dead ends. Didn't understand that those valuations lead to dead ends. Not because you're not good enough to handle it. Not because you're not powerful enough with power or universal enough with authority. That's not the point at all. Being a superman with power just simply hastens the moment of the dead end. It's a dead end. They are dead ends because of structure. They structurally generate their own dead ends. The dead end being that the, if you step up a polarity to its ultimate, it shorts out. That's what happens. And it happens every single time. Long before that happens, those people holding on to it electrocute themselves. Uh, Ezra Pound, once in a letter, said of James Joyce, he was a man who was electrocuted by divine fire. He kept holding on to the live wires that he didn't understand. You don't hold on to those wires. You use that power, that electrical power, in a way in which is characteristic of it, but you don't hold on to the live wires. In the 21st century, we need to learn to not hold on anymore because everyone's going to be electrocuted who does. It just simply has reached that point. So this is not simply a good idea. This is the portal. This is the way out. This is the way further. You can go. You can go from here. Everything else tends to find a very severe dead end, rather quickly, I'm afraid, rather quickly. So we're using pairs in triads. We're using two cubed, which becomes an eight-fold structure, so that every quarter in a two-year cycle of eight, which is the two cubed again, 
So this structure reverberates in harmonic all the way through on every level, in every way, that if someone would participate in just white water rafting the streams of current of this process, you would get it. Because this course is like a, a promised land. It's like a land which recognizes you as you come to recognize it. The old uh, saying in Chan Buddhism in China was whatever you are looking for is looking for you. And that realization is a meeting. You're not finding or getting. It's old fashioned for someone to say to you, do you get it? The Renaissance phrase in Shakespeare was well met. <laughs> the proper greeting is not so much grabbing uh, someone, but uh, the exchange of the kiss. That's well met. That's a complementation. The kiss is a perfect symbol of the complementation. Complementarity happening. So that when the spiritual person in the maturity finds through equilibrium the affinity with the existential body, the body is saved by a kiss. Have you never read fairy tales? They're absolutely true. The myths are only provisionally true. They're only true in the integral cycle. But fairy tales are conscious forms. They're completely different. They're true differentially. When we come now to Burkhardt and Hegel, we're coming to the apex. We've built history patiently by two pairs, and now we're coming to a third pair. The first pair was Thucydides and Benjamin Franklin. The second pair was St. Teresa of Avila and Tacitus. And now we come to Burkhardt and Hegel. Now, it's extremely difficult intellectually to read Hegel. It's very taxing. To read Burkhardt is also very taxing, not because his language is so complex like Hegel or his ideas so highfalutin and complex like Hegel, but Burkhardt was a very peculiar individual. I think perhaps we should start with him for just a moment, fill in who these people were, then take a break and then come back and, and build further from there. Burkhardt was born on, in Basel, Switzerland, which is a little jutting part of Switzerland that goes into usually what has been Germany or some kind of German estate, not far from France. Basel, as a part of Switzerland, has been sort of a, a center of European quality rather than national qualities. Basel itself was an independent city for many, many centuries. Not many people, 30,000, 40,000. But they were fiercely independent, and so they had a university and this university was not far from the great cathedral in Basel. And it was phenomenal that such a little independent city would have two great institutions like its university and its great cathedral. It would be like Thousand Oaks having one of the world's greatest universities. Uh, the people of Thousand Oaks supported it themselves. So at the universal, quality of respect for learning in Basel was very high, always has been very high. Burkhardt became the number one professor at that university for uh, a long time, but not because of easy circumstances, but because of severe circumstances. In order to get the background for that, one has to understand that he grew up in a household. His father was the minister, the priest in the great cathedral. He grew up in one of the favored families. 
someone pointed out once that uh, Basel and uh, his early days was like uh, what they say of old Boston. It was a closed elite circle of aristocratic families and they simply ran everything. And Burkhardt came from one of those that ran everything. They always had. Top of the line. And yet Burkhardt went through such sufferings that by the time he was 40, his hair had turned bleached white. He never published a single word after 1860. He lived for almost uh, 40 years. The biggest comparison that one can make is to the American historian Henry Adams. Henry Adams, who lived in Washington, D.C., alone and critically scrunched up for the last 20-some years of his life. The great-grandson of a president, the grandson of a president, and the son of Lincoln's ambassador to Britain, one of the greatest of all historians, had nothing to do with the rest of his time, sat in Washington and watched it go to hell. Burkhardt did the same thing in Basel. Not that Basel was going to hell, but Burkhardt could see that Europe was going to hell. He said as early as the 1840s, there is no way to reverse the wave of barbarism that's coming. The only thing that we can do is to try to garner together as much of the classic civilization of the world that we wish to preserve and hold on to it and try and save it from the onslaught. That's the only thing we can do. When Burkhardt died in the late 1890s, about 100 years ago, the notice brought uh, wide questioning looks from people because they had they hadn't realized he was still alive because he had lived alone, not publishing, trying to save what he could of the remnants of the treasures of civilization. When he died, the uh, Europe of that time still thought of itself as the British phrase, they were no longer subject to the changes of nature, no longer subject to the laws of evolution. They had crawled ashore from the ocean of change. They were exempt from the evolutionary uh, threats and changes. It was uh, less than uh, one generation from the beginning of World War I. Burkhardt was always considered after that after the First World War began, a kind of a prophetic uh, personage. And it's only in the decades after the Second World War where an enforced forgetfulness has tried to lull the population back into some sonambulance of the 19th century that Burkhardt has been singled out as being some cultural nice boy who talked about the Renaissance. In fact, he is one of the most profound prophets in uh, the modern world. Nostradamus is nothing compared to Burkhardt because he saw exactly that it isn't somebody throwing dice somewhere in the universe making alien connections. It's ourselves not making the connections that are real that allows for regression to shatter everything down into a reductive junk heap. And the fact that the world looks all right um, is just an illusion. It's a junk heap of, uh, of valuations. And relationalities hardly last longer than the time it takes to criticize them. Let's take a break and come back. Let's come right back here. We're talking about history. We're talking about a process of building structure. And each time that we have done this, we have gained amplitude. And we've also gained a kind of a current. So that by now, the seventh uh, wave of this should have a lot of resonance to it. Hopefully. 
What's important, though, is to concentrate for a moment, just for a moment. If you have only one moment today to concentrate, this is the moment. It would help. Do you know how E equals MC square was made into nuclear power? By implosion. The problem was to get a complete sphere that would blow into the exact same center at the exact same time. Nuclear power doesn't happen in middle class nature. No matter how nice you are in your parlor, you will not have nuclear power. No matter how high in the skyscraper your office is, no how powerful your law firm is, you cannot make nuclear power unless you make a transformational node. Here's the transformational node in the education. Drift some other time. We're building a structure, and each time we built this structure, we've come to a third level which completes the form. When a form is complete, it becomes real. When it becomes real, it evokes its complementarity. When you make a form, God is there. That's the old religious form of it. You cannot command the divine presence, but if you make a form of receptance, receptacle, of reception, what do they say? If you build it, he will come. If you make a form that accepts a presence, the presence will be there. Now, this is all standard. It's not even wisdom anymore. It's just a part of the data of civilization. The Greek word is epiclesis. Epiclesis means the laying in of divine power, not by you or them. The only thing you can do is to open it up. God lays it in. So we're building now a form, and when the form is made, the presence will be there, whether you know it or not. Over Jung's uh, lintel, going into his garden at his home, he had carved, um, God called or not will be there. As soon as you make that portal, the entrance of the presence happens. The only thing that human beings can do in a wise way is to be good hosts. Now the secular form of making an openness so God's presence can be there is leaving an extra place at the table. Because God may come in the personage of a wandering stranger and you want to be ready to receive. If there's only one moment, this is the moment, and if you're not prepared, you'll miss it. What is this implosive point? This implosive point is that when a form is made instantly with no time space whatsoever as a lull, the complementarity is there. As soon as a human person, even in one iota, begins to become differentially present, it evokes a complementation. And the complementation is that existence begins to wake up. The body begins to become ears up, tail up, alert. 
one of the apocryphal ways of expressing this is one of the esoteric little stories about Jesus as a boy. Jesus is out working with his father, carpentry shop. Nazareth was not a town, it was a, a crossroads and it was a craft shop for the Essenes. And Joseph made things and the little boy Jesus was an apprentice to his dad, he was working. And his mother comes and tells him in the apocryphal story that she was afraid because this other mysterious stranger who looked exactly like Jesus had come and she had tied him to this uh, post of the bed. And Jesus went running in and there was a complete black human being version of Jesus exactly there and he quickly went and untied him and they embraced and disappeared into Jesus. It's an apocryphal story of saying that complementarity is mysterious and it happens instantly and what happens in complementarity is that the paredness becomes oneness but that the oneness is not one it's a oneness so complete that it vanishes from the scale of numericality. You can call it zeroness, and that's like an approximation. But that the zeroness has a peculiar property. It registers as an ordering every time any number is used. It's like the zero in 10. If you take the zero from 10, it's no longer 10, it's one. So the decadeness, the perfect formedness of 10 is that the zero works, it counts. What does it do? It confers an ordering space that receives a higher order. So that 10 is a symbol of epiclesis. It's as simple as that. But 10 functions in a differential way as one functions in an integral way. So when one counts differential energy, one counts, even today, we count by tens. How much is such and such a power? Oh, well, it's, it's 10 to the 23rd power. How much are two? Colliding galaxies, well, that's like 10 to the 47th power. And that turns out to be exact and accurately real. One can express it in any number, even with any number of decimal points, times 10 to its power, and you can find whatever exact number there is anywhere in the universe of any happening on any scale. And the order will be exact, will be truthful, and one can write it and know it, apply it. We're building a form, and the form has reached a point to where we can say this. At the culmination of history, it occurs to man for the very first time that he's involved in a differential process of making the universe recognize that he is as real as it is. That's why the end of history is a salvation point. Have you never heard that? In any religious tradition whatsoever, Zoroastrian, Buddhist, Jewish, Christian, Muslim, any of them, the salvation moment is when Heaven recognizes you, knows who you are, knows your name. In Texas, it's called home free. Suffer's waiting, they got a place for you. You're the unknown guest at the table that has been set since time even began. 
What do you think they're talking about? Parlor tricks? Psychological manipulation? Not likely. This quality is perilous, but also full of promise. At the very same time, at the very same instant, the peril is that you will not be attentive because it never stays, because it's not static. It's going to go one way or the other. It's called the knife edge. In Persian uh, religious vision, it was called the Chinvat Bridge, which later became, in uh, Teutonic lore, the bridge that goes into Valhalla. It's a bridge that is so narrow that it's like the sharpest knife edge and the only way to get across is to be guided across by the keeper of the bridge, Dana, the spirit of grace in the universe. When she goes with you across, you go into paradise. If you don't, back to the junk heap. Why? Because it's a watershed that is never static. It goes differentially further or it goes regressively back. And it's very difficult to stop a regression on this scale. Because it's not like something that your gym prepared muscles can hold back. It, it, that doesn't make any difference whatsoever. The crossed fingers of every planet and every star system within uh, astronomical vision have no effect on that regressive power. Why? Because it's a cosmic scale. But the invite, the invitation, the promise is that a single spiritual individual is welcome to progress from there. You don't have to have all the power of even the cross fingers of everybody in the room. Just you and your differential maturity. You're free to go, free to enter, free to sit neat. You're welcome. That place is ready for you. So that the progress or the regression at this particular node is of asymptotic, of infinite uh, concern. So that the closer one gets to this kind of a threshold, this kind of a watershed, the more there is like a gorgeous peril, a tone of, of jittery happiness. <laughs> Hegel's college buddy, one of the greatest mystical poets of German tradition, Friedrich Hölderlin, wrote a poem to the sun god, which expressed at the time when they were young men, this kind of romantic cosmic hero presence. Where are you, drunken, my darkening soul reels at all your rapture? But for a moment since, I saw the young enchanting god, tired after his day's travel, bathe in the golden cloud his boyish curls. And still now, my helpless eye pursues him, but gone he is. And far to peoples living in piety who still revere him, Earth, I love you, for with me you are grieving. And like hurt done to a child, our sorrow changes to sleep. And as the winds flutter and whisper among the strings of a musical instrument till the master charms, the lovelier tone from it. Swirling dream and mist around us play till our lover return and life and the spirit catch fire in us. Mm -hmm. 
German romanticism at the time when they were boys had this kind of perilous, expectant, joyous, charismatic quality. And in the midst of all this came the French Revolution. Hegel was 19 years old. They were writing these kinds of poems. They were talking in this kind of a way. There was this kind of millennial expectation seated by the American Revolution. They were wondering what's going on, this colossal, sudden energy loose in the world. And the French had been primed by Benjamin Franklin for a generation and ignited by Thomas Jefferson, who spent five torrential years having all the makers of the French Revolution to dinner and making sure that when the revolution happened, he was at long last on the stage to Calais, leaving Paris. But the American Revolution for some 25 years had seeded the French sensibility that the world is ready to change when you do it. And when the French Revolution hit like that, young men everywhere in Europe, the men in England, the men in Germany, the men in Italy, the women in England, the women in Germany, the women in Italy, everyone suddenly woke up. The American Revolution was over there across the ocean. The French Revolution was here. But one of the problems that was there was that the French Revolution, unlike the American Revolution, was tied up in a single person. The American Revolution, that single person who really nursed it and foddered it for several generations, was wise enough as a wisdom sage to step aside and to leave the chair empty. Benjamin Franklin. It was enough of a universal master of wisdom to know at the moment of transformation, you leave the seat empty. Because whoever is doing it, they have a right to that seat. And that seat being differentially multiple an infinite number of times, an infinite number of people can occupy that seat. And that's the way that it should happen. That is a spiritual democracy. Anyone who's there deserves to be fed because they have worked to be there. This is their house. Anyone who is living there, this is their house. That's the nature of variety and freedom. That's how it works. But the regressive form of that was the French Revolution. The French Revolution, which very quickly became a headhunting matter. Very quickly, it collapsed and condensed so that it was represented by one man only, Napoleon. The energies of the failed French Revolution went into the pocket of Napoleon. And Hegel, like most of the conscious individuals of the time were absolutely charismatically stunned by Hegel, seeing Napoleon in person. When they saw Napoleon in person on his horse, there was something catastrophically real about this, that somehow this was the only hope. He was like the emperor of Rome. He was like the pharaoh of Egypt. He was in his person the only person who mattered. And it isn't just an Egyptian or a Roman archetype. Dynastic China had the very same thing. We have a census in the time of Han Wu Ti in China, 140 BC. The Chinese civil service, which had been instituted then for about two generations, numbered about 130,000 people, and they served one man, the emperor of China. Empires 
dynastic forms always point to one man as if that one man was the transformational node. Whereas the transformational node is a zero, it's a differential openness which must be extended to whoever is there actively participating. They all are there. It's as stupid to think that one man represents the power of the universe as it is to think that one geographic location is the magical spot. Because when a landscape is differentially awakened to the spirit of the thing, the entire landscape is magical. Not this stone, not that tree, not this spring. Those are phenomena that happen in nature. They most certainly do. They happen in ritual, yes, absolutely. They happen in myth, you bet. They happen even in symbols. Truly, truly, they do not ever happen in the differential cosmos of freedom and variety. The whole nature, the whole purpose of it is to understand that everything has changed. Everything, everything. It's not this anymore. There's no charismatic leader. A Napoleon was a signal that the thing was in a regressive mode. And even someone like the 19-year-old Hegel, super intelligent. I don't know if you can put an IQ quotient on a person like that, 200 maybe. He had written his first fantastic big book, The Phenomenology of Mind, The Phenomenology of Spirit. He'd gotten into one of these book contracts where he got advance money in order not to be sued for it, so you have to give it back. He had to complete the manuscript on a certain day, and that day was October 13th, 1806. And he finished the manuscript, and he didn't have time to make a copy. It was the single manuscript, and on that very day, Napoleon marched with his troops into the very university town where Hegel had been teaching in Jena. And Hegel looked, literally, looked up from his study out the window, and there was Napoleon on his horse, and here was his great manuscript, one of the most complex books ever written. And he was filled with peril and promise at the exact same moment. He posted his original manuscript and sent it to the publisher, didn't have time to make a copy, and then suddenly realized that the whole country was at war, and Napoleon had taken over everything. Yet the manuscript somehow reached the publisher and was published in 1807, and since then has um, been the peril and promise of philosophers everywhere. Because with that particular publication, Hegel became the most influential philosopher of the modern world, bar none. Hegel's resonance extends everywhere. All of Marxism is but a little offshoot of Hegel. National socialism in Germany was a little regressive offshoot of it. Many of the developments of positive spiritual democracy are positive offshoots of it. So that Hegel is the number one influence. He's like the Plato, the modern world. Is the most seminal figure intellectually of the last 200 years. And yet, it's always difficult to understand a genius. It's very difficult. Not simply because they work on scales and depths and heights and levels that to most of us are kind of mysterious and who knows what's going on. But that someone like a Hegel takes into themselves this adventure of having stepped into a differential field that nobody had stepped before, where no man has gone before. It's like a late resonance of that. That's like Gene Roddenberry repeating Hegel some 140, 50 years later. 
Whereas back when Hegel was first saying it, he was saying it in a fresh way that no one had ever said it before. It was like new terrain in the unfolding gestalt of a cosmic scenario. And there's no way to take it back. Once you've opened the door, you have to go through. What was it that Oppenheimer said? Just the instant before the first nuclear explosion, before the first atomic bomb, just moments before, he tried to stop it. He literally tried to lunge at the controls to stop it there in New Mexico and fell. Couldn't get there in time. An explosion happened, the first nuclear explosion. It turned the New Mexico sand into white hot radioactive dust in picosecond. And those in the control room were utterly shocked that one of the world's greatest physicists for a fraction of a second had gone Dionysian shamanistically mad. Oppenheimer looked up from the floor and he said something in ancient Sanskrit, which people later on understood that he had quoted the Bhagavad Gita about the avenging angel of death that God in his titanic negative way is the destroyer of worlds. Yes, demons create hell, but a vengeant God kicks the hell out of hell. There's no comparison whatsoever. It's the difference between a mosquito and using star systems as fly swatters. There's no comparison whatsoever. What Hegel did in his book, The Phenomenology of Spirit, was to step into a new realm of differential consciousness from which we cannot go back. One of the greatest resonance of it was that the 19th century progressively felt the titanic impact, the resonant waves of that. And the resonant waves were such that the 19th century mind experienced the dissolving of the material context of the confidence of life. That progressively, as the years and decades went on and the generations came in their phases, they began to experience the dissolving of the certainty of physical reality. These things were not real anymore. Nothing that you could pound was real. The confidence was gone. Hegel himself, with great humility and perhaps this genius of bringing someone else into the culpability of it, said, well, it's uh, because of Kant, not because of me. <laughs> it's Kant's critiques, right? The critique of pure reason, the critique of practical reason, the critique of judgment that he's the one who set up all of these abstract uh, uh, points. I just took it on from there. I, just, I expanded it from here. But it was Hegel and not God. When Hegel was first lecturing, it was very difficult to follow him because he was so fearful and, and convoluted because of the complexities that he had loosed in himself that he used to mumble without looking up, and people had to strain to hear, and when they could hear, they couldn't understand, couldn't understand a thing that he said. And only later, when they started to compare their lecture notes, they realized that they had been told something that was so titanic that it just simply didn't register yet. Most of Hegel's books were published after his death by people who had written notes down and the flow of genius works just kept coming out, and people realized that what had been released here was like this Pandora's box. Hegel died in 1831. He died of cholera, a cholera epidemic. He was not only the most famous professor at the University of Berlin by that time, he was the rector of the university. He was the number one intellect in, in Germany at the time. 
But within a generation, the legacy of that titanic push into an unknown differential consciousness had its reverberations, and one of the first persons who got it was Jacob Burkhardt. Burkhardt understood that what was really at issue here were historical energies, not philosophic points that the intellect was having trouble following, but that this had a reverberation in practical life, a reverberation in the theoretical structures that practical life responds to, and that history was also the certain kind of history that these things are real was also dissolving. And Burkhardt was the first person to realize that the comfortable histories that were the safe, secure spot of civilized human beings were dissolving as if by some kind of nucleic acid and that there wasn't anything that anyone could do to hold those forms. They're going to go that there was a time lag, and it'd be a while before people realized or were alerted, but that eventually all of them would go. All of the secure historical context of civilized human beings were doomed because of the acid released by Hegel's adventure in consciousness. Just one little tiny aspect, he dealt with a form that Plato initially had dealt with. The form was called dialectic. Actually, in Greek, diuresis does not mean dialectic, it means division. Dialectic is not so much like a tennis game. It's like a polarization that cements and freeze dries to your peril or it's a complementation which makes magical proliferation the norm so that you become caught in something far worse than you had even suspected. You're not caught in a dialectic which is difficult to control. You're caught in a situation that's either going to freeze dry into a permanent stasis or it's going to be an ever-increasing proliferation that magically is unstoppable. You're going to live in a magical universe, or you're going to live in a totalitarian end point of history. There's no in, middle ground in between. So that someone like Burkhardt realized as early as the 1840s that what was facing them was not a problem of handling dialectic, a young philosophy student named Karl Marx thought it was something that you handle dialectic in history and that that's going to be okay. And out of that came Marxism. Oh yeah, we're going to ride this out. And the Soviet Union is the great experiment of trying to use Marxist dialectic and a Leninist gun a revolutionary version of it to dominate the forces of history, and we saw where that led to. It led to dead end, a self-recognized dead end, 1991. And that's just the beginning of the dissolving of that whole form. Not only the Soviet Union, but Russia as we know it will dissolve. It's this kind of a quality, and that's just a little part of it, that the dialectic in Hegel's thought is not a tennis game of polarities. It resolves either into a complementation that leads to an enchanted universe, or it becomes a freeze-dried totalitarian quality. Both Hitler and Stalin fell into that negative. This whole quality becomes available for introspection, not in Hegel's time, but in Burkhardt's time. Burkhardt, who became the mentor 
for a genius young philosopher in the same city in Basel, Friedrich Nietzsche. And it was Nietzsche who, under private tutelage with Burkhardt, finally got the message. He was the first thinker in that whole era to understand what Burkhardt was teaching him about what Hegel had done. And in a way, the 19th century in its dissolving of certainty, the entirety of the civilization that it was founded on has dissolved into uncertainty. The fact that there's any semblance of order is complete illusion, total illusion. There's nothing whatsoever. One of the most profound historians at the middle of the 20th century wrote a book, From Hegel to Nietzsche, The Revolution in 19th Century Thought, Karl Lovas. And it simply is like a little pap smear that says the patient is dying. The entirety, not of that national history, not of those cultures, but the entire civilization that founded all of them is dissolved is dissolving, is dissolving into nothing. Here's how Burkhardt put it 150 years ago. It's, not, it's called seeing the handwriting on the wall. Rome, we're back to Rome all of a sudden. <laughs> What's the saying? Ejo de biche. Rome, which had emerged from obscure Hellenic, Trojan, Italic beginnings, became the mistress of the Mediterranean and thus realized the historic moment of Italy. The Orient, that's the Mideast, with its attempts at world monarchies, Greece with its colonial world, Carthage with its location and its commerce, and the entire great barbaric West are fused into one empire, one civilization. Then, this whole, close to collapse, is entrusted to a great new world movement, Christianity, under whose protective wing enough of it lives on to make possible a revival of the culture of the, in the 14th and the 16th centuries. Since then, our horizon has been overshadowed by it. Rome is everywhere the conscious or tacit, that means unspoken, both conscious and tacit premise of our views and our thought. If in the essential intellectual points we are now no longer part of a specific people and country but belong to Western civilization, this is a consequence of the fact that at one time the world was Roman, universal, and that this ancient common culture has passed over into ours. Thus, East and West belong together, that they constitute a humanity the world owns, owes to Rome and its imperium. The history of Rome is the highest, in the highest sense the second part of ancient history. The currents issuing from everywhere flowed together into one transmissible civilization. That is why we're concerned here in this essay, with Roman antiquities. Only to the extent necessary for an understanding of what was needful for the growth and development of Rome as mistress of the world. Moreover, we shall gladly do without the true secret. And then he goes on to say that this entire construct is absolutely fictitious. that it lasted for centuries, that it lasted for millennia, is due to the dogged projection of hundreds of millions of people. And that its dogged projection required a certain habit of mind, and that when Kant snapped his fingers to alert us that those habits of mind are not universal, and Hegel spelled it out, it meant that that illusion was over. The jig was up. The game was, was not over. But gamesmanship itself 
was forever impossible because man had crossed into enough consciousness to know when he was fooling himself. It's not a matter of having a new Rome. That's what Napoleon said. He said the French empire is the new Rome. He dressed his troops in Roman capes and helmets with the little clipped horse hair. Have you never seen the paintings? They were the new Romans. He was taking back the Roman Empire, this time in French hands. They, that's why he's called the emperor. Beethoven, to sort of uh, show him up, wrote the, 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 the symphony and the emperor concerto and all these things to show up Beethoven. Beethoven wanted to... Uh, say, uh, you know, the ar any artist like myself is much more than the so-called emperor. He's fooling around with things of this world. We're playing with universal energies. Who, do, who does he think he is? That apocryphal story when uh, Goethe and Beethoven were taking a stroll together down this street in this city that Napoleon had conquered and he came riding down the street and and Goethe, ever the diplomat, tugged on Beethoven and said, let's go on the sidewalk. And Beethoven tugged back the other way. He said, let him go on the sidewalk. <laughs> He's nothing compared to us. In Hegel's time, Beethoven and Goethe still had the confidence that artists, artistic, mature, conscious persons, could handle these energies. But by Burkhardt's time, Burkhardt was severely alerted that this may not be so. And the only person in his time who got it was Nietzsche. He heard Burkhardt real good that the art and culture was perhaps epiphenomenon of this whole civilization. And since it was dissolving, who knew what art and culture were going to be, if at all? Maybe there is no such thing as art culture. What do you do when the whole universe is up for grabs? More next week. Mm -hmm.